I'm very happy to be here this morning and to meet with you and to receive this honor and to have the chance to talk something about a little bit about my experiences and thoughts and feelings about nuclear weapon. Uh, I just made a last minute change in my plan. I'm just speaking from the heart. I'll just put the paper away. Okay. Um, really, it was a total shock, surprise to learn that I was going to receive the award from, from this organization. Um, especially when I learned that people around the world voted for me. Well, I didn't realize that I had so many friends around the world, but, uh, well, I thought it was a miracle that I received. And not only I, but my fellow colleagues, the members of the Hibaksha Association in Japan, they are together remembered and honored with me. So on their behalf as well, let me give you my heartfelt thank you. Thank you. Now, I use the word Miracle, lightly, but really, 71 years ago, I did experience miracle, and here I am in your company today. So I thought next short while I would share my personal experience with you. I know many of you are um, experts, uh, arms control specialists. And I'm sure you're quite well informed and knowledgeable of all kinds of human conditions, including the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapon. But I thought I would offer my personal and firsthand uh, experience. Um, in 1945, I was a 13-year-old a grade 8 student in the girls' school. And on that very day, I was at the Army headquarters. A group of about 30 girls had been recruited and trained uh, to do the decoding uh, work of the top secret information. Can you imagine a 13 year old girl doing such important thing? That shows how desperate Japan was. Uh, I met the girls in front of the station at eight o'clock, no, before eight o'clock, and at eight o'clock at the military headquarters, which was 1.8 kilometer from the ground zero. I was on the second floor and started the morning assembly. And the Major Yanai gave us pep talk. This is the day you start proving your patriotism for emperor, that kind of thing. And we said, yes, sir, we will do our best. When we said that, I saw the bluish white flash in the window. And then I had the sensation of floating up in the air. When I regained the consciousness in the total silence and darkness, I instinctively tried to move my body. I couldn't move it, so I knew I was faced with death. Then I started hearing whispering voices of the girls around me. God help me. Mother help me. I'm here. So I knew I was surrounded by them, although I couldn't see anybody in the darkness. Then, suddenly, the strong male voice of the world, don't give up, I'm trying to free you. He kept shaking my left shoulder from behind. He pushed me. And keep kicking, keep pushing, and you see the sun ray coming th through that opening. And get out that way, crawl as quickly as possible. And by the time I came out of the building, it was on fire. That meant about 30 other girls who were with me in the same place were burned to death.
but two other girls managed to come out. So three of us looked around. Although that happened in the morning, it was very dark, dark as twilight. And I started seeing some moving dark object approaching to me. And they happened to be the streams of human beings slowly shuffling from the center part of the city to where I was. They didn't look like human beings. Their hair was standing straight up, burned, blackened, and swollen, bleeding. Parts of the bodies were missing. The skin and flesh were hanging from the bones. And some were carrying their own eyeballs. You know, they are hanging from the eye socket. And as they collapsed onto the ground, their stomach burst open with intestine stretching out. And the soldier said, well, you girls join that procession, escape to the nearby hill. That's what we did by carefully stepping over the dead bodies, injured bodies. It was a strange situation. Nobody was running and screaming for help. They just didn't have that kind of strength left. They were simply whispering, water please, water please. Everybody was asking for water. We girls were relatively lightly injured. So by the time we got to the hillside, uh, we went to the nearby stream and washed off the blood and dirt and we tore off the blouses and soaked them in the stream and dashed back and put, to put them, to hold them over the mouth of the dying people. You see, the place we escaped to uh, had the military training ground, huge place about the size of two football fields. The place was packed with the dead and dying people. We wanted to help, but everybody wanted the water, but no cups and no buckets to carry the water. That's why we resorted to the rather primitive way of so-called rescue operation. That was all we could do. I looked around and see if there were any doctors and nurses, but of course, I saw none of them in that huge place. That meant tens of thousands of people in that place without medication, no medical attention, medication, ointment, nothing was provided for them, just a few drops of water from a wet cloth. That was a level of so-called rescue operation we could offer. Now, we kept ourselves busy all day doing that. And of course, all the doctors and nurses were killed too. Just a small percentage of the medical professionals survived, but they were serving people somewhere else, not where I was. So when the darkness fell, we three girls together with hundreds of other people who escaped the place, we just sat on the hillside. And all night we watched the entire city burn, just feeling numbed from the massive scale of death and suffering we had witnessed. I was not responding appropriately, emotionally. Something happened to my psyche. What well, Dr. Lifton talks about psychic closing off or psychic numbing. In an ultimate situation like that, the cessation of the emotion takes place automatically. And it was a good thing. I'm glad of that explanation. Because if we responded emotionally to every horrific sight I witnessed, I couldn't have 
survived. Um, that's the end of that very day. Um, other people can tell about being near the rivers and the rivers were full of um, floating dead bodies and so on, but I didn't see the river that then. But I'll tell you about the few people in my family, my friends, how they lost their lives. That would give you just how the bomb uh, affected human beings. Um, I talked about 30 girls who were with me, but the rest of the students were at the city center. The city was trying to establish the fire lanes to be prepared for the air raid. So all the grade seven and grade eight students from all the high schools were recruited, brought to the center of the city. And uh, they were providing the manual labor. Now, they were in the center right below the detonation of the bomb. So they are the one who simply vaporized, melted, and carbonized. My sister-in-law was there with a student. She was one of the teachers supervising the students. Now, we tried to locate her hopes, but we have never done so. On paper, she's still missing. But together with thousands of other students, oh, I understand there were several thousand students, seven, eight thousand and so. They simply disappeared from the face of Earth. The temperature of heat, I understand, was about 4,000 degrees Celsius. Another story I can tell is about my sister and her four-year-old child who came back to the city the night before to visit us. And early in the morning, they were walking over the bridge to the medical clinic and both of them were burned beyond recognition. By the time I saw them the next day, their bodies were swollen twice or three times larger than normal, and um, they too kept begging for water. When they died, the soldier dug up the hole and threw the body poured the gasoline through the lighted match, and with the bamboo stick, they kept turning the body. Hey, the stomach is half burned. Brain is not quite burned yet. There I was, a 13-year-old girl, I was standing and motionlessly just watching it. And that memory troubled me for many years. What kind of human being am I? My dear sister, being treated like animal or insect or whatever, there was no human dignity associated with that kind of uh, um, cremation. The fact that I didn't even shed tears troubled me for many years. I felt guilt. So later years, as I went to the university, I started learning how human beings behave in the ultimate condition. And Dr. Lifton's death in life was a big help. I could forgive myself after learning how our psyche automatically functions in a situation like that. But you know, it's the image of this four-year-old child which is burned to my retina. It's always there. And that image just guide me, and it's the driving force for my activism. Because he came to represent all the innocent children of the world without understanding what was happening to them. They agonized to death. So he is a special being, a special memory.
if he's alive, he's 75 today. It's a shocking thought. But regardless of passage of time, he's still a four-year-old child guiding me. It was interesting, Mr. Obama made a lot of reference about innocent children, how we need to protect each one of them. And I was weeping. I couldn't help it. Now, let me tell you another example of how atomic bomb affected human beings. We rejoice to hear my favorite uncle and aunt survived. They were okay. They didn't have any visible uh, sign of injury. Then several days later, we started hearing different story. They got sick, very sick. So after my sister and the nephew died, my parents went over to my uncle's place, started looking after them. Their body started showing purple spots all over the body. And according to my mother, who cared for them until their death, their internal organs seemed to be rotting, dissolving, coming out of the thick black liquid till death. The entire inner from their bodies came out. My mother used every material and old newspaper, everything to use as a diaper. But that was one way of dying. Now, radiation works in many um, mysterious and random way. Some people were killed immediately, some a week later, a month later, a year later. And the horrible thing is, 71 years later, people are still dying from the effect of delayed effect of the radiation. Now, <clears throat> um, the struggle, Hibakusha, uh, in other words, survivors, Hibakusha's struggle uh, was unexplainable in the aftermath, you know, um, surviving in the unprecedented, um, catastrophic horror. And the unprecedented um, social political chaos due to Japan's uh, defeat and occupation forces, strict control over us. Um, but if I start giving the detailed story of that, that would take the whole morning. So maybe I'll stop. But the struggle in the aftermath was very difficult. Now, I finished university uh, in Japan and Upon my graduation, I was offered the scholarship, so I came to your country. I came to Virginia, very close to this city. And that was 1954. The United States tested the biggest uh, hydrogen bomb at the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific that time. And... Uh, creating the kind of situation, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki experience. And uh, it, the entire Japan was up in arms uh, with fury. It was not only Hiroshima, not only Nagasaki, now the Pacific Bikini at all. Well, United States keep continuing with the testing and actually using them. And that's when entire Japan became fully aware of uh, the nature of nuclear weapon development. Anyway, at that time, I left Japan, arrived in Virginia in August, and um, I was interviewed by the press 
and I gave my honest opinion. I was fresh out of college and naive uh, and believed in honesty, and I told them what I thought. The United States uh, nuclear policy was bad. It has to stop and look at all the killings and damage to the environment in the Pacific. That has to stop and all these kind of things, I said. And next day, I started receiving hate letters. How dare you? What, do you realize what you are? Who is giving the scholarship? Go home, go back to Japan. And just a few days after my arrival, I encountered this kind of situation, and I was horrified. It was quite a traumatic experience. What am I going to do? I can't, I just arrived, I can't go back. And I can't put the zipper over my mouth and pretend I never know anything about Hiroshima bombing. Would I be able to survive in North America? Well, I spent a week without going to the classrooms. I just had to be alone and do my soul searching. It was a painful and lonely time. The new country, I hardly knew anybody. And then this question I faced. But I, I'm happy to say that I came out of that traumatic experience week with a more determined and a stronger conviction. If I don't speak out, who will? I actually experienced it, so it, and it's my moral responsibility to share my experience, to warn the world, it seems this is just the beginning of the nuclear arms strings, and I just have to warn the world. So that was the beginning, all right, well. I'm reminded of my time. Well, I think I explained briefly why I have been doing what I have been doing. So uh, most of my life, adult life, I have been speaking in school, high schools, universities, women's groups, uh, rotary clubs, anywhere people want to learn what it means to live in nuclear age. From my very perspective, I know the government say one thing, but this is what I feel because I experienced it. I thought it was important contribution I could make. And I'm suggested that I am to stop. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Satsuko. Uh, um, I think it's extremely moving, as always, for us to hear these stories from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as from uh, uh, radiation victims, downwinders, atomic veterans, uh, Bikini Atoll, South Pacific Islanders, you know, Kazakhstan, Lopnol victims, or many, 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 as we know, that all, all can relate to this to some extent because they've suffered and continue to suffer all the the health illnesses from, from radiation poisoning over the world. Um, I'd, I'll open it up for questions now. Uh, I think I'll, I'll pose a first question, I think, to um, Setsuko to get the ball rolling. We have about um, 25 minutes, I think, to uh, continue discussion. But, but first of all, Setsuko, give us a little sense of how you then came from Virginia, uh, where I'm so glad that you were determined to speak truth to power, as we say. Uh, how did you come from Virginia to Toronto, Canada? In Hiroshima, and then got a scholarship to come to Virginia. Now, the school gave me full scholarship. You see, by that time, I had some, some sort of idea I wanted to become a social worker because in that chaotic situation, 
everybody needed the help. And my church minister dedicated his life and uh, supporting those people. And I wanted to become a helping person, somebody who can help and contribute society to build up the city. And for that, I needed a social work professional training. Japan's training, uh, social work training in Japan at that time was not quite well established. So I came here to study directly from Japan. Ah, you did to the United States or to Canada? Then? United, the United States. States. Then I went to University of Toronto. I did the further study. And then I went back to Japan. I practiced social work, taught social work. And then 62, my family, you see, I got married. I had two little children by that time. So we all came back to Toronto in 62, ever since I have been the permanent resident of Canada. And, and I have done social work all my life. And, and but the peace work at the same time. Absolutely. It was pretty. Well, I give you enormous credit for sticking with it this long, this many years. And it's very, very important that you do, I think, because no one, practically no, no one has really experienced, obviously, and except the Hibakusha uh, that survived uh, those bombings, a real nuclear weapons explosion. You know, it's, it's not uh, usual for people to really understand, I think, what nuclear weapons are all about. Um, so with that, let me, let me turn to the audience. Uh, I know there are many, many questions. I have many more questions I could pose, but I think I'd rather turn to you to give you the opportunity to ask questions right here in the front table. Yes. And please introduce yourself first. We have a, because we're on C-SPAN too, uh, let me emphasize, wait for the microphone before. Hi, uh, Alex Leibowitz. I was wondering what people thought had happened. Obviously, Japan had experienced normal bombing uh, from non-nuclear weapons, but here was something where it was one explosion. Did people understand that? Obviously, they didn't know it was a nuclear weapon. What did they think had happened when the, uh, when the blast came? Well, my immediate reaction was, well, finally, Americans got us. Uh, well, nobody knew about a new type of weapon. So we thought it's usual incendiary bombs because United States started, uh, indiscriminate attack of major cities. By the time we were attacked, I think about 70% of the urban centers in Japan were all, uh, reveled. And Starting with Tokyo, I think in one night over 100,000 people were killed. I think hundreds of B-29 flew over them and thousands of tons of incendiary bombs. But in Hiroshima, only one did the trick and most of the city disappeared. But no, we had no idea. It took some time before we knew clearly what it was. The government deported new type of bomb was used. That was all we knew. Yes. Right in the middle. Yep. I'm Carlo Trezza from Italy. Uh, there would be many, many questions to ask, but uh, I'll just stick to maybe one. Uh, first of all, uh, you said that it it was, uh, you started your presentation indicating that it was a miracle that you are alive. Uh, I think that all of us around here, after all, we are alive uh, and it is a miracle since uh, there were so many occasions where we were almost on the border of a, of a, of a nuclear war. Therefore, <laughs> it is a common situation. But. Uh, since you are a, a, a hibakusha, uh, a category which unfortunately will inevitably disappear, I think that uh, what is very important is uh, to maintain the momentum of uh, awareness of the international public opinion on that. And uh, I think uh, that um, one of the major uh, events was uh, President uh, Obama's visit to uh, uh, to Hiroshima, how 
do you want how what is the best way to perpetuate the testimony and the awareness and the education of people in 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 your view to 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 maintain you know the momentum of uh, of, of of awareness thank you You mentioned Mr. Obama, President Obama's visit to Hiroshima, and that brought 600 reporters to the city. And I think all around the world that was reported. Well, he has that kind of power, influence. Um, well, even I in Toronto on that day, I had eight interviews. Can you imagine eight? TV station coming to my place asking what I thought about it. Well, what power president have? Well, maybe he can do something like this, create the opportunity so he can mobilize, but not just him, but all of us who know something about the issue. I think we can active, intensify our efforts to make this issue credible and visible. I don't think we are doing enough. And I think the, I don't feel that the government is encouraging the people to learn what it's like to live in a nuclear age. Government isn't, whether maybe they think the ministry or department of education area, they should be doing a better job. But as I know in Japan and in Canada, and some of the United States. I don't think school system is doing a good job either. I think more budget could be directed to those educational institutions and intensify the teaching. And of course, the churches and the families, homes. Uh, the, the children's parents grew up without knowing about it. So they are hesitant. They avoid children's questioning the parents. And the children learn not to raise such question because parents are horrified when they raise such question. R rather sad, symbiotic kind of relationship. But anyway, everybody, education system, religious system, even government, I shouldn't say even government. The government can look at the reality and improve the situation. Now, about the survivors, as you say, the number is dwindling. They have been leaving us with their dream of abolition in their lifetime unfulfilled. It's very sad. Well, I really take my hat off for the way they have dedicated their lives, traveling near and far. But we are at the same time very disappointed. Don't quite feel rewarded. The public attention to us is limited. And when I first came to the United States, people kept justifying Hiroshima, the use of arms. I'm afraid to say, even today, majority of people maintain that mentality. So that's how limited progress we made in the knowledge of I hope I'm wrong. I like to hear other people's opinion on this. That's okay. uh, yes, right here, and then I'll come over, over here. Then I'll go in the back. Okay. I know that you spoke at the Vienna Conference on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons, and you were recently at the open-ended working group in Geneva on the um, elimination of nuclear weapons. The, ban and um, 
stigmatization. And I'd like you to speak a little bit about the humanitarian initiative and in relation to the NPT. Well, I have been working on the issue of nuclear disarmament for many years. But for a long time, I felt that so much uh, work was being done. I mean, people put so much emphasis on weapon system and the theory of uh, deterrence. And they believe it and uh, all the associated topics. Even you, I went to the peace meetings, they were spending time to discuss, to catch up with government's progress in that line. And I used to feel, my gosh, for me, when we talk about the nuclear weapon, it's what it, those things did to humanity, what they happened to their lives, to their cities. But somehow that kind of attention was lacking. So several years ago, when I started hearing about humanitarian impact of nuclear weapon, I thought, wow, it's about time. We should be looking at this. This is the real basic uh, issue of importance. Of course, that doesn't negate the importance of security uh, issues. And some people criticize this movement by saying too much attention to hum humanitarian consequences. No, I don't think that's what they are saying. But I was delighted. The attention was shifted from deterrence theory to the humanitarian consequences. And I could, I, I was delighted to see the, the strong, um, sentiment, the mountain interest on the topic around the world. And not only white haired people, but the younger people. Hey, we, when we grow up, we want our world to be intact, be there for us to enjoy life. And they are very keenly awake to push this idea. So um, I was very pleased and I am part of this movement. And another thing which pleased me was that although nuclear weapon states have the legal obligation uh, to work toward disarmament um, under Article 6, but they haven't, they weren't fulfilling that obligation and not much was happening. It was a huge disappointment when I learned it's been in existence 45 years. What has it produced? And majority of non-nuclear weapon states said what we have waited for nuclear weapon states to take the lead and work for the disarmament. They are not doing well, we are not going to wait anymore. We are going to stand up and join our hands together and work with NGOs and civil society. Now, Red Cross representing civil society, NGOs, and 127, I think, non-nuclear weapon states, they're all working together to work for prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapon by um, creating the legally uh, binding instrument. Um, to me, those majority of non-nuclear weapon states so impatient with the lack of progress by the Conference of Disarmament and Non-Proliferation Treaty and so on. And they want to, okay, if they don't, if things are not happening there, 
we have to see what we could do. That standing up those so-called weaker nations, but coming together in number and putting heads together and working out the most effective measures uh, to to achieve elimination, prohibition, and so on. I think it seems now the entire world is wake up and they are ready to work. I think this is great. Instead of leaving the fate of the world just to the new, nine, well, five nuclear weapon states, recognized by the United Nations and additional uh, four nuclear weapon states. If nine states want to keep what they have and not to do their obligation, that is to work for them. Well, it seems the whole world is waking up to the shared to realize the shared responsibility. And a lot of young people involved in this uh, movement. That is a very good news for me. We can, we have people to work with and some good ideas are coming out. Would you like to say a few words about that? Well, you people know all about that, so I don't do that. Okay. This is this is a group of experts, Hatsuko, but uh, some of us know a little more, some a little less, you know, in different areas. So you're, it's just wonderful to hear your your impressions, uh, which are very very special, I think, and, and extremely important today, um, because we we don't hear from Hibakusha all that much, actually, even in Washington D.C., uh, let alone in Japan, I assume too. Uh, certainly in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I'm sure. But uh, it's it's very very good, I think, and we we've made progress to date, largely because of people like yourself and yourself and your colleagues who've made a stand and a, are, as I say, speaking truth to power on the humanitarian impact of of nuclear weapons. I would point out too that uh, I think it's 126 countries have signed the humanitarian pledge. 127 now. Good. All right. I stand. I stand corrected there. <laughs> Okay, we have a couple more questions, and I think enough time for. We'll try to go through, try to keep the questions brief, and uh, and we'll try to get through everybody. Yes, Martin. Thank you, Paul. I'm Martin Fleck. I work with Physicians for Social Responsibility, and that means I work with our mutual friend, Dr. Ira Helfand, who sends his greetings. Uh, and actually, you just answered a, a lot of my question. Um, Physicians for Social Responsibility is working with the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons uh, to promote the prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. And um, I agree with you about um, the new momentum that's happening. But there's a lot of skepticism here in the United States about the Prohibition Treaty because none of the nuclear weapons states have, they're, they're pretty much all opposing it. None of them have uh, supported it, and none of the umbrella, so-called umbrella states that are under the nuclear umbrella have supported it. So, Ms. Thurlow, are you optimistic that we will still achieve such a treaty despite all this opposition? I know uh, there seem to be several different approaches in achieving prohibition elimination. But as one New York-based lawyer said, I think he's a head of lawyers for something, that organization. As he says, that those differences of emphasis, the approaches, can be worked out. So whether it's a nuclear weapon convention or ban treaty, I think a bit of difference can be worked out. Let's first prohibit, let's stop the threat and the use of the nuclear weapon. And surely 
we can, we can achieve it. Why not? We should seize this opportunity. I think the time is now. I have waited 71 years. If we don't seize this opportunity, and I know Mr. Obama talked about uh, maybe this won't happen in my lifetime. He repeated it once in Prague and this time in Hiroshima. But why? Why not? If there is a strong political will, it could happen. It can happen. So, yes, I still am hopeful and I believe it can happen because enough people, not enough, but uh, a lot of people are pushing for it. And if we can get other people join in the effort and keep pushing, but why not? And why don't we communicate our strong feeling to Mr. President, even before he leaves the office? We can't afford to wait generation and generation. And 71 years is much too long to wait. We wasted. I believe we can and we should. Let's take another couple questions quickly. Uh, there was somebody in the back who had their hand up. Uh, yes, right here. The glasses. Yep. I'm Kathy Robinson with Women's Action for New Directions. Mostly, I really want to say thank you so much for being here and thank you for all of the work that you've done and continue to do. Um, it was phenomenal and amazing that the president went to Hiroshima, but the reality is that this president, with with the complicity of the entire U.S. government and the Congress, is, is aiming at spending a trillion dollars over the next 30 years uh, to for the next generation of nuclear weapons. We seem to find a lot more money for the next generation of nuclear weapons and not so much for the next generation of humans in this country. And I wonder if you could just comment on, on that and how these budget uh, priorities are, are really uh, driving, a, driving a dangerous future. I share your profound sense of sadness and even anger. If somebody get me the invitation to speak with the president, that's one of the first thing I would talk about. Yes. Well, that's great. That's great. Really. I, I don't know what more to say. I just feel very disturbed by that. And yet, when he turns around, he says beautiful things. Well, I was wishing this time in Hiroshima, he would, oh, no, this didn't. Well, I don't know what more to say, really. Um, you know, I, I have been social worker all my life. I work in schools and do the counseling for the family, dysfunction, and learning disability of the children and so on. Those schools are falling apart. They don't have enough budget to buy necessary supplies and so on. Why can't we? directing your taxpayers' money to the hospital and schools to enrich people's day-to-day -day life. Instead, one trillion dollars is going to produce the wicked weapon. I don't even call it a weapon. It's a device of mass murder. Well, somehow we have to well, we have to ask the president to deprioritize from his sense of responsibility. I really don't know what else 
contradicts that. It's just the crime, depriving humanity in order to have so-called security. And based on the false notion of deterrence as security, from my perspective, I just cannot. I'm sorry, maybe my response is not sufficient, but I just share your feeling. This is my anger. Thank you, Setsuko. I think your response is very appropriate, and I think we all uh, deserve, uh, Setsuko deserves a good round of applause from us for bringing us back to reality to some extent. <laughs>